Hi, it's 7 p.m., so I'd like to call the meeting to order. Mr. Chairman Lofton, would you leave some invocation, please, sir? Yes, thank you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we watch nature bring forth the beauty of spring, awakening from the winter's rest, we are reminded that we are fortunate to be able to live, work, and play in this county where the fruits of our labor are so abundant. Awaken in us, if you will, the spirit of community, of helping those less fortunate, and an abiding sense of appreciation for those who provide the security that keeps us safe and cares for us when we are in need. Guide this board tonight in our thoughts, words, and actions as we deliberate the issues before us that our decisions will be the right ones for this community. In his blessed name we pray, amen. 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 Dr. Flurry, lead us in the pledge, please. Yes, if you'd please stand and face the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag, flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Option of the agenda, are there any proposed changes? We have uh, one proposed addition, Mr. Chairman. Um, you have a resolution regarding the uh, funding for Allen Middle School, mm -hmm. which we would propose adding under tab D, the uh, commissioner's refund. Okay, that would be D2. D2. Okay. So the request, how would the board like to handle? So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. Motion to approve and second. Any discussion? All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, no. Consent agenda, any proposed changes? No, sir, Mr. Chairman. All right, how would we like to handle the consent agenda? Move for approval. Motion to approve, sir. Second? Second. Second, any discussion? All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, no. All right, that will bring us to citizen comments, agenda items that are not subject to public hearing. Did anyone sign up? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, Amber Wallen. Your name, Magisterial District, and limit your comments to three minutes, please. Thank you. My name is Amber Wallen, and I'm part of the Opecan District. I want to start by thanking you for seeing the need to replace, not remodel, Ayler. However, I have some concerns in the stipulations that have been placed on your proposed resolution. If there are requests, as stated in the originally published draft of the resolution, I'm happy that the dialogue is out there and the communication between the Board of Supervisors, School Board, and constituents is happening. However, if there are demands that might be, must be met in order for funding to be provided, I have some serious concerns. I respect the difficulty of, your deci of the decisions you have to make and understand that while most of us uh, who speak here have one or two concerns we are hyper-focused on, you have to figure out how to make the big picture happen. To help get you there, you have a team of experts to advise, research, and report their findings. You let other educated people help you educate yourselves to make educated decisions. Except sometimes it doesn't seem like that's happening when it comes to the schools. We have educated experts from the school board that you seem to dismiss time and time again. You ladies and gentlemen control the purse strings, but you do not control the schools. You are not an educator. You do not know what is best for our students, except perhaps supervised rep. <laughs> you have a school board, experts in their field that do. They know what environment is best for students to learn in. They know how many kids can fit in spaces and still learn effectively. They know what kind of space schools need to best educate our students. They know how modern education works. But you see dollar signs, square foot, and student capacity without evaluating the relationship and impact one has on the other. These numbers do not occur in a vacuum. There is most definitely a correlation between them. Our children are not to be treated as cattle, stamped and tagged and forced into pasture because you say they will fit. It's preposterous that you see a 140,000 square foot school being able to serve the same population as a 187,000 square foot school. It's the same as saying, we don't need a minivan, we can all fit in this Mini Cooper. I guess technically you all fit, but not effectively or legally. And if you, are, and if you know you are picking up people along the way, why on earth did you not plan ahead and take the minivan? You can either have a building with room to grow and the student capacity you desire, like Frederick County Middle with 187,000 square feet and 900 student capacity, because you gave the school board a budget of, of 52 million, or you can stick to the 45.5 million budget cur currently provided to get a school that fits for right now with only 140,000 square foot, which is anywhere from 10 to 47,000 square feet smaller than every other middle school in the district. 
that will simply will not end up giving you the 900 square foot, so the 900 student capacity you seem to desperate to have. If the county can honestly not spare any more than 45.5 million, we are not turning our nose up at it. We will take it gladly, but you have to accept that it is out of your realm of expertise to determine what the budget will provide in school design and student capacity. You have to rely on your educated education experts to advise you about what your financial contribution will do for our students. I think that all of the other requests about VDOT and ha planning to, for expansion later and the old dealer being handled back are practical and helpful, but when it comes to the design and student capacity, you need to listen to what your experts and constituents are repeatedly telling you. You have to decide where to dig your heels in, 45.5 million or student capacity. If you're drawing your line in the sand with capacity, you have to find more money for a larger school. If you're drawing the line in the sand with the 45.5 million, we gratefully accept, but you need to be realistic about the fact that the 140,000 square foot you insist is not going to serve 900 kids. And the addition, one sentence, it's almost done. Uh, the addition. Next time, please. I'm sorry? Time your comments okay. next time, please. Uh, will be need, the addition that you need will be, is going to be knocking on your door before you know it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Sophia Guntang and Jessica Shostak. Hello, my name is Sophia. And my name is Jessica. We're from the Back Creek District. I'm an eighth grade student, student council member, band member, dance team member, and an all A and B honor roll student from Ayler Middle School. I'm also an eighth grade student, student council member, band member, and an all A and B honor roll student from Ayler Middle School. We are here representing the Robert E. Ayler student body, amazing staff, and extraordinary teachers. We are here to speak once again about Ayler. From what, what have been, from what we have been hearing from you and others, we are probably rebuilding Ayler. We completely agree with you, but there's one thing I'm very worried about. That's the space. 140,000 square feet is way too small for the amount of kids being sent to Ayler. Because Bird and James Wood are becoming extremely overpopulated, they have to rezone, and many students that should be going to Bird and James Wood are coming to Ayler and Frederick County Middle. Ayler needs to be able to take all of those students coming from Bird, James Wood, and all the new homes. I know that some of you think that spending the least amount of money to keep taxes low will benefit the county, but if the schools did not have the capacity to hold the number of students from the many families moving in with young children, the schools will become overpopulated like many other schools are now. <coughs> James Wood Middle School is 150,000 square feet and Bird Middle School is 160,000 square feet, which is 20,000 square feet lar larger than Ayler that you all are planning on building. Both schools can hold 900 kids and are both overpopulated. Frederick County Middle School is 47,000 square feet larger than Ayler and you, that, they, that you are planning to, on building, which is 140,000 square feet. Frederick County Middle can hold 900 students, but only has 683 students go, going there. With, with the students from Bird, James and the new families coming from, sent to Ayler and Frederick County, there might be the perfect amount of students in, in middle school for the max capacity, <coughs> but you need to think about the future. With all the new homes comes all the new families and kids. Right now, the amount of students going to middle school in Frederick County Public Schools is 3,212 as of March. The max amount for the school is 3,420. We yeah. don't feel like we are treated as fairly compared to the other schools in the district. The 140,000 square foot Ayler is going to be smaller than all the other middle schools that are now. Think about how overcrowded the schools are with the square footage they are at. We would like to thank ama the amazing teachers. They take so much time out of their day to teach these students. They come to school every day to find an unsafe, unwelcoming school. They do not deserve it. We also would like to say a huge thank you to all of the janitors that have been working so hard at Ayler to keep it looking its best. All we ask is that you think for the future. Don't use the bare minimum, min, minimum for something you want to last. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Well done. Chris Fordney. I'm Chris Fordney, the Red Bud representative on the Parks and Rec Commission. I'd like to speak to you an item on your agenda tonight, the plan for low-income apartments behind St. Paul's Church on Sensory Road. I believe this is a good project and the church is to be commended, but I have some concerns. My first concern is that this matter is being handled through an amendment to the comprehensive plan rather than the rezoning that would normally be required to increase the density for this project. I would hope that this procedure is not being used as a way to avoid a discussion of proffers. 
There are already many new houses being built in Eastern Frederick County that are not generating proper money because the rezonings took place so long ago. The board needs to make sure that new developments pay their fair share for new public facilities. A second concern has to do with the pedestrian access for this apartment complex. Mr. Wyatt stated in the previous meeting that the occupants will not be driving very much. That means they will be on foot, which means they will have to risk their lives walking on an increasingly busy Sensony Road or remain landlocked in this apartment complex. There is an undeveloped commercial property adjacent to the church that will include a pedestrian trail at some point. I believe the developer should have some obligation to work with that property owner to get this trail put in now so that these residents will have safe access to the Handy Mart and the Frederick Heights Park to the east. I also think there should be a crosswalk to the country store. These kind of goals, walkability and access to park facilities, are prominently enunciated in the urban classification that this project seeks. So let's not just talk the talk on these issues. Let's literally walk the walk by insisting that new developments include these kind of urban amenities in this developing urban area. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Tara Shostak. Hi, my name's Tara Shostek. I'm a, from the Back Creek District. Um, I've looked at the Board of Supervisors resolution that I believe y'all are gonna vote on tonight, and I've also seen an earlier draft. The, the earlier draft of the resolution included language that said that the board was requesting that the school board consider the five items that are listed, and this revised draft makes it sound more like if the school board doesn't agree with the five things that are listed on the Board of Supervisors, resolution that they wouldn't even consider, um, it sound, they talk about, y'all talk about considering the appropriation of funds. Um, I'm a little bit concerned about the, basically the legality of this document and trying to force on the board, the school board, these five stipulations or the appropriation wouldn't even be discussed. Um, there's case law that clearly states that the board, the, the Board of Supervisors doesn't have authority over construction of schools once the funds have been appropriated. Um, and my concern is that this is an attempt to kind of wrest control over the construction of the schools from the school board. Um, the governing body has limited oversight and school expenditures through the budget and appropriations process, but this role has not been interpreted as authorizing the governing body to exercise general control over school board ex expenditures. Um, the statutory authority of local school boards to control the construction of public schools and expenditure of funds for that purpose are with the school board, not with the Board of Supervisors. So I strongly encourage that the language of this resolution be revised to show that it's not a mandate that the school board follow these five requirements and that it be a suggestion and an opening for discussion. But the way this is worded makes it sound like you all aren't even going to discuss it with the school board unless they first agree to these five um, requirements. So I have concerns with this. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> That's the last person signed up. Is there anyone else who cared to speak on an issue not subject to public hearing? Anyone? Seeing no okay. one, we'll close the public comment portion. Board of Supervisors comments, are there any? Mr. Chairman. Supervisor Dunn. We're having a two-way conversation, and I don't know all your names, and you know who we are, but for the first person that spoke here tonight, three of us have taken a day to go out to Brambleton. It's in Loudoun County. We're trying to educate ourselves as well as we can to make Supervisor good. Dunn. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, Supervisor Lofton, would you join me? Sure, it. <clears throat> would the Baker family come forward and join us, please? Thank you. Um, this is the resolution of appreciation honoring the life of Tom Baker. Whereas Tom Baker was born in 1938 in Winchester to the late Mary Sullivan Baker 
and Charles B. Baker and graduated in 1956 from Hanley High School where he was president of his class. And whereas Tom Baker went on to attend Virginia Tech, graduating in 1960 with a degree in electrical engineering and settled with his wife Sheila in Winchester in 1963. And whereas under the guidance of Tom and his wife Sheila, Camp Fantastic, serving those children and families affected by cancer was conceived and funded beginning in 1983. Whereas Tom Baker also co-founded Special Love Incorporated to support and fund future Camp Fantastic events and activities. And whereas the Winchester Frederick County community greatly benefited from the dedicated efforts and tireless energy of Tom Baker in his many community-based endeavors, including the donation of their home and surrounding land by Tom and his wife to help create the Youth Development Center. Now therefore be it resolved that the Frederick County Board of Supervisors extends its sincerest thanks and appreciation for Tom Baker and honors his life of leadership, dedication, and selfless volunteerism in the community. Adopted this 14th day of February, 2018. Please join me in thanking again the Baker family for their huge contributions to our community. will bring us to committee appointments. Mm -hmm. Board of Building Appeals, um, I believe we're still waiting. That is correct, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Um, Extension Leadership Council, Stonewall. Uh, yes, sir, I'm happy to report that Mrs. Loving has agreed to serve for a second term and very grateful for that. Absolutely, she's served with such great distinction. So I make a motion that we approve for a second term. Is that necessary? It is. Second? Second. second. All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, no. Thank you. That will bring us to um, Historic Resources Advisory Board. I believe we're waiting on that one. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we have spoke with Mr. Perry, and he does not wish to be reappointed due to his um, schedule. So we are looking for an applicant for the member at large position. Right. Thank you, sir. Winchester Regional Airport Authority, we have two uh, terms expiring at the end of next month, and so I'd like to leave those for now. And I believe, I believe that brings us to the end. Okay. Come on, come with me. That will bring us to requests from the commissioner for refunds, Supervisor Slaughter. Um, or? Mr. Chairman, I've got it. Um, Mr. Tierney. We have, we have uh, four uh, refunds uh, this evening. The first being for rider truck rental in the amount of $3,382.62 uh, for personal property taxes in 2017. Um, as a result of vehicles being sold or moved out of the county. The second is for Wheels LT in the amount of $3,905.02, also for per personal property tax on vehicles for 16 and 17. Um, these vehicles were moved or sold. Um, third is uh, undisclosed taxpayer, and this is related to a disabled veterans relief um, the amount is for $6,670.46 for real estate taxes for the years 2011 through 17. And the final uh, re request is from DL Peterson Trust in the amount of $20,286.20 for personal property taxes on vehicles between 2015 and 2017. 
um, all of these have been reviewed and um, have met legal muster. Thank you, sir. How would the board like to handle these? Mr. Chairman, I would move um, for the refund for Rider Truck Rental LT in the amount of $3,382.63. Um, refund for Wheels LT, amount $3,905.02. Disabled Veteran Relief, $6,670.46. And DL Peterson Trust, $20,286.20 and the corresponding supplemental appropriation. I've heard the motion, is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Supervisor McCarthy? Aye. Supervisor Slaughter? Aye. Supervisor Lofton? Aye. Supervisor Dunn? Aye. Supervisor Trout? Aye. The chair votes aye and the motion carries. That will bring us to the Finance Committee and I apologize for being ahead of myself, Supervisor Slaughter. Yes, sir. Um, the finance. Oh, sorry. excuse me. We, we had the addition of the resolution. I'm oh. sorry. That was, um, that's I thought right. we put that. I see. D1. We did. D1. So, Supervisor Trout. I want to disclose for the record relative to this item and pursuant to the State and Local Government Conflict of Interest Act that I am employed by Frederick County Public Schools as a teacher and therefore I'm a member of a group who are or may be affected by the item and that I'm able to participate in the transaction fairly, objectively, and in the public interest. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. So this is where we uh, injected a resolution regarding a replacement ailer. How would the board like to handle this one? Motion to approve the resolution as stated. Second. Motion to approve and a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none. Supervisor Trout abstains or voting? No, I'm voting. Aye. Thank you. Supervisor Dunn? As stated, aye. Supervisor Lofton? Aye. Supervisor Slaughter? Aye. Supervisor McCarthy? Aye. Chair votes aye and the motion carries. Now, Supervisor Slaughter, we we'll get to the Finance Committee. Right. Um, the Finance Committee held um, their meeting on May 16th. Items number one, two, three, and four were approved under consent agenda, and I would make a motion to approve those at, on consent. I've heard the motion. Second, Second. Mr. Second. Chairman. One, two, three. And four. And four, and four under consent. <coughs> Are you ready? McCarthy? Aye. Supervisor Slaughter? Aye. Supervisor De Lofton? Aye. Dunn? Aye. And Supervisor Trout? Aye. The chair votes aye and the motion carries. Item number five, the treasurer requests a general fund supplemental appropriation in the amount of $52,000. This amount represents funds needed for DMV stops for the remainder of the fiscal year. No local funds required as revenue collected has exceeded it has exceeded budgeted revenue. I would make a motion for the committee recommends approval and I would so move. There's the motion, is there second. a second? Second. Second, is there any discussion? Supervisor McCarthy? Aye. Supervisor Slaughter? Aye. Supervisor Lofton? Aye. Supervisor Dunn? Aye. Supervisor Trout? Aye. Chair votes aye and the motion carries. Item number six, the Department of Social Services request a general fund budget reduction in the amount of 220,000. Of that amount, $58,875 represents local funds. This, the reduction represents year-end adjustments to bring the county budget in line with the state budget. The committee recommended approval and I would so move. Heard the motion, is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Supervisor Trout? Aye. Supervisor Dunn? Aye. Supervisor Lofton? Aye. Supervisor Slaughter? Aye. Supervisor McCarthy? Aye. Chair votes aye and the motion carries. And the last item on the agenda, the Department of Social Services requested a general fund budget transfer in the amount of $48,231. The amount represents a transfer out of health dental to be used um, for additional expenses. No additional local funds are required. The committee recommended approval and I would so move. Heard the motion, is there a second? Second. And a second. Is there any discussion? Supervisor McCarthy? Aye. Supervisor Slaughter? Aye. Supervisor Lofton? Aye. Supervisor Dunn? Aye. Supervisor Trout? Aye. Chair votes aye and the motion carries. All right, Ms. Perkins, that will bring us to 
<clears throat> Public hearing, rezoning 0517, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. This is a request to amend the proffers associated with rezoning number 03 of 2006, which was approved back in 2008. That application rezoned 394 acres to the EM Extractive Manufacturing District with proffers. I can direct you to the screen on your left. The subject property is outlined in black. As you can see here, and for reference, Chapel Road runs through that property in that location. Now, I'm just gonna go through the proffers that have changed, what was originally proposed with the 2006 proffer versus what is changing. Um, so uh, just to start for the general provisions, which is the first part of the proffer statement, they're proposing the removal of the overall plan and the four phasing plans, uh, the removal of viewshed 4B, 5B, 6, 7, 8, and 9. They're keeping viewsheds A, 1A, 1B, 2, 3, 4A, and 5, and they're adding viewsheds 1, 2, and 3. Now for proffer two, which is the site development, these are the changes to the berm height and landscaping. The approved proffers stated that the berms would be a, a maximum height of 30 feet and a minimum height of 10 feet based on the 12 viewshed plans. Now the main changes are to berm D, which are proposed with this revision. Now they've broken berm D into four sections. In those four sections, you have section one, which is the closest to Western view, section two, section three, which is along chapel, and then section four. And I'll go through each of those individually. Now, Berm D, section one, as I stated, the area near Western view, right here. Now, this was proffered at 30 feet originally. This is proposed to be reduced to 20 feet, as well as moved back from the common project line with the subdivision. You have Berm D section two, which was proffered at 30 feet. Now this revision shows the 30 foot berm, which is consistent with the approved proffers. However, the proffer statement in your package did state that that the berm could be reduced down to 10 feet if it conflicted with the cemetery or the stream. Now there's Berm D section three and Berm C. Both of those were proffered at 10 feet and that's consistent with the approved proffer. And then lastly, again, Berm D section four, it's a 20 foot proffer, excuse me, 20 foot berm, which is consistent with the approved proffer. Now, continuing with proffer two, site development, the berm timing. Berms C and D from the original phase two were to be installed no later than 10 years prior to the commencement of mining north of Chapel Road. Now this amendment would state that berm C and D would be installed after permitting and two years prior to the extraction of material for processing. Now, the other section of proffer two is the landscaping portion of the site development. They are proposing to remove exhibit three, which describe the plants to be installed on the berms. And the approved proffer states that a mix of deciduous and coniferous plants, plantings placed in a random manner to be consistent with the existing vegetation. And the proffer now adds to that that the plantings will include a seed mix recommended by the National Park Service that is currently in use at the adjacent Cedar Creek and Belgrove National Historic Park. Now, a note with some of those changes, uh, the landscaping originally would have been installed on the berm 10 years prior to the commencement of mining. So now that's reduced down to two years for the uh, time frame to establish the plantings on the berms. Now, some of the other uh, revisions proposed in this. First, the soil piles cannot exceed the height of the highest berm north of Chapel. There's no extraction of materials outside of the berms. The field between berm D, section one, and the Western View development would not be used for uh, parking or storage of mining equipment or any vehicles and or equipment shall be staged in this area only while they are engaged in maintenance, monitoring, and or exploration activities. Hours of operation shown in your agenda, 5 a.m. to 11 p.m. However, there is an option in there upon notifying the neighbors that they could modify those based on natural events or production demands. There's also a blasting notification provision, a stationary seismograph north of Chapel. They are proposing to remove the proffers for rights to water supply and reclamation that were in there, as well as a lighting proffer stating it would be turned off uh, after working hours. 
Now, while not proposed for a change, I just wanted to do a site access clarification because I've heard some comments and some questions about the Chapel Road access. Now, staff would note that the approved proffer from the 2006 statement states access via public secondary roads shall be limited to the quarry entrance on McCune Road. Proffer 2.1 prohibits access to Chapel Road for quarry operations. It, uh, the proffer GDP, I would note, also shows a proposed tunnel that could be used for access under Chapel Road, but direct site access to Chapel for quarry operations is prohibited by proffer. And just for the uh, where this has been, the Planning Commission public hearing was back on November 15th. They proposed postponed that for 90 days. It came back to them in February where they did recommend denial. It came before the board at your March 14th meeting and your April 25th meeting. So with that, I would be glad to answer any questions. We are seeking a decision from the board on this amendment and the applicant here uh, is here to give a presentation as well. Thank you. Questions, Ms. Perkins, anyone? I, I do have one comment. Chief Breslau. I know that it's the 12th hour, not the 11th hour, but you did receive some further revisions to My the- My apologies, I did pass out uh, the proffer amendment that we received this afternoon. We didn't really get a chance to go through them in depth. The applicant will be able to go through the points that they have changed. Other questions, Ms. Perkins, anyone? Thank you, ma'am. All right, who wants to start? Thank you. Uh, my name is George McCotch, Carmoose Lime and Stone Area Operations Manager. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the board, as mentioned previously, I served in the mining industry for 40 years. First and foremost, we want to thank the board for your patience to allow for further discussions with our neighbors. I send a special appreciation to Supervisors Lofton and Dunn for reaching out and working with our community and by having, in addition to our meetings, numerous meetings with our neighbors. I also want to thank both supervisors for taking the time from their busy schedules and, and visiting our property to take a look not only at the area north of Chapel, but our operations and our facilities. Folks, we started this process when we started this process, Carmus truly thought it was proposing something that was better and less impactful than what had been approved with the rezoning back in 2008. Carmus certainly understands and appreciates the time that this proper amendment has consumed and how valuable time is to all of us. With that said, I want to simply state this vote comes down tonight to one of two outcomes. The first is leaving the rezoning and the proffers as they are and as approved in 2008, and the other is to approve the proffers as have been amended and as are before you this evening. I will say Michael will address, there has been some last minute changes, uh, so what was up earlier does not represent the latest, greatest version. There's a choice before you tonight to approve or not to approve this proper amendment. We understand the concerns that's been voiced by our neighbors and we believe we have addressed them. Throughout this process, Carmoose's only objective has been to lessen and soften the impact of mining activity to our neighbors by delaying and placing activities further from the homes we thought and continue to think to be a good thing and nothing more. To recap, we have met with the community on multiple occasions, just like any business, we want to partner with our neighbors. And we believe we have examples like volunteering for Cedar Creek reenactment events, supplying free stone, supporting efforts to build little league fields, and the annual scholarship at the local high school. Having said that, we're here tonight, no more funny business or last minute spin. I want to be clear and on the record, items like the water and the access are ordinance and not for debate. We are not altering anything 
and that's not a part of this proffer amendment. At this time, I would like to request Michael to the podium for his presentation. Again, we will be happy to listen and address further comments after the presentation. Michael, thank you for your consideration. Thank you, sir. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Michael Wilmoth. I'm a production manager for Carmuse Lime and Stone. Uh, in your packet this evening, uh, you should have a copy of the amended proffer statement, uh, as well as a summary outlining the major changes uh, provided by staff, uh, showing the multiple revisions of the proffer amendment going all the way back to 2017. Uh, we heard Ms. Perkins speak to most of those, and, and we'll cover those as well as the, uh, the edits uh, that Mr. Lofton was referring to. Uh, tonight in the presentation, I'd like to walk through those edits uh, that have made since the uh, that have been made since the last board meeting. Uh, if you'll direct your attention here to your left, um, many of you have probably seen this uh, this slide before. Uh, it's an aerial image showing the original locations of the berms as well as the proposed changes. Uh, the orange uh, berm sections are what the original 2008 proffers. Uh, describe. Uh, for reference, here's the Western View neighborhood. Uh, Chapel Road runs along the south uh, to here. The green is what we call Berm C, uh, or is what is labeled as Berm C. Uh, that has uh, not been on previous slides, but thought it important to, to point out that it does still exist and will still be constructed. Uh, the area in magenta or purple here is the proposed location for the berm, uh, detailing the latest uh, heights um, for the varying sections that you heard Ms. Per, uh, Perkins describe. There's four different sections broken out, one, two, three, and four. Uh, one thing to note, the original berm locations, this is the property line here, it's an existing fence line. Uh, this berm, the toe of it is approximately 100 feet off of that property line. Uh, the proposed location uh, backs the, what is called section one, uh, behind an existing tree line. Uh, and is approximately 800 feet away from that property line. Uh, to put that into a little bit better perspective, uh, this was an image that I took from, uh, from one, of the, one of our neighbor's backyard standing uh, by his gazebo in 2016 when we started this process. Um, the vegetation that you can see here is the property line and we superimposed what that 30 foot berm would look like if you were to stand on his back deck. Uh, the image in the bottom is what that berm would look like if we were to implement the promote, proposed amendment, which moves that berm behind that existing tree line, which is here of cedars, uh, and reduce it in height to 20 feet. It completely disappears behind the tree line. Uh, summary of changes. So these are the major changes that have been made through the eight revisions going back to 2017. And again, you heard Ms. Perkins talk through most of them. Uh, Berm D was subdivided into four different sections. Originally, it was all one height. Uh, through meeting with our neighbors and having community meetings, uh, we got feedback that different folks on different sides of the berms would like different heights. So we broke that berm into different sections, into four different sections of varying heights, ranging from the 10 feet all the way up to 30 feet. Uh, the tree line, uh, moving the berm section one behind the tree line, uh, there was a concern that that tree line could get taken out at some point in the, in the future. Uh, we've added language that would preserve up to 60 feet of a minimum of that tree line. Uh, the tree line that stands itself is about 90 to 100 feet thick now, so a minimum of 60 feet of that tree line would be, be preserved. Uh, timing for berm C was originally struck from, uh, it was tied to berm D and was originally struck. Uh, we've added language back in that berm C will be constructed uh, similarly to berm D, which is two years uh, after permitting and prior to the extraction of material for processing. Um, and then activities uh, in the field, that was a, a point of, uh, of concern, was what could happen in that field if we back up in this field here, if we were to move this berm behind this tree line, what activities could take place in that, in that field? Uh, so we have added language that the only thing that can take place is maintenance, periodic maintenance, if we were to have to drive a pickup around and, and check the berm or the vegetation, 
uh, monitoring, so seismic monitoring or monitoring wells and exploration. So if we were to need to bring in a core drill or something of that nature. Um, section 2.4, language was added uh, about notifying neighbors 48 hours in advance if we were to have to change our normal operating hours. If we were to have to go outside of our norm that we would give the neighbors a 48 hour uh, notification that we would have to work an additional time period. Um, section 4.1, uh, monitoring wells, so there's three monitoring wells in the current uh, generalized development plan. At a minimum, one of those would be installed six months after the approval of the proffer amendment. Uh, section 6.1. Uh, based on neighbor feedback notification, uh, it was a, a request from our neighbors that uh, on days that we blast, any and all blasting, uh, that we give notification to those who request it within the 1500 foot ring. Uh, it's approximately 85 homes. Uh, if all 85 folks request it, then we would give notification to all 85 folks prior to blasting, uh, whether it be through telephone, email, text message. Um, Section 8.1, uh, language was added uh, regarding seismographs, uh, about putting in a stationary or a permanent seismograph at a strategic location. Uh, it was further defined that that would be placed, its location would be defined uh, in coordination with a licensed professional engineer uh, that was familiar with, with uh, seismic monitoring. Uh, section 10.1 uh, refers to lighting. Uh, we added additional language about that any and all lighting will be turned off after working hours uh, in the area north of Chapel Road. And then finally, section 12.2, uh, we added language regarding that tree line or that fence line that it would need to be maintained uh, using best management or farm practices. We currently lease that field out to a farmer who raises hay on that field and we don't want him to lose the ability that if he were to have to trim a, trim a cedar tree or something back that he would still have that flexibility. Um, the last slide that I have for you tonight are the, uh, are the final edits that uh, Supervisor Lofton was referring to, uh, the latest and greatest as George put it. So uh, most of these pertain to section 2.2, which is site development. So um, there was a section uh, or section two of Berm D, which is the area, and forgive me, I'm gonna scroll backwards so uh, that you get an idea. So section two is on this side of the property, which is at 30 feet. Originally, there was language that stated that that berm would be built at 30 feet unless it were to encroach uh, on a cemetery, which is located right here. And then there's a stream that runs right through this tree line. So it would be built at 30 feet unless it were to encroach on one of those two. And then it would be built at the maximum height possible. We've struck that language. So it simply states now that that berm will be built to 30 feet. Um, and that's the second bullet point as well. Uh, the third bullet point, adding specific language uh, about the plantings. Uh, currently it states that uh, the plantings would be um, planted in a random matter to make it look uh, natural. Uh, there was a, a question or a concern that was brought up and to add specific language uh, describing plantings uh, consistent with what's in the Frederick County Ordinance. Uh, so talking about planting densities, uh, size of the trees, whether it's a sapling or uh, how big the diameter is of the trunk that when we plant it. Um, last on 2.2 was eliminating the, ter the word long-term. Uh, in that field, it stated that we could not use that field for long-term parking um, and that, that, that section of long-term has been struck from that. It now says that it can't be used for uh, a parking or storage. Uh, and then lastly, uh, on section 2.4, um, I believe Ms. Perkins had it on the screen earlier, is 5 a.m. to 11 p.m. That has changed to 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. And that's all I had, so thank you for your time, and we look forward to your vote, unless you have any questions. Are there any questions? I do have one question. Um, when, when you talk about the change in normal operating hours, there were provisions in the first packet of information that we received that unless um, the demand changed, like what constitutes excessive customer demand. So has that been taken out of the what we were handed this evening? No, ma'am. That is still there. That is still there. Uh, ma'am, I can address that. Uh, that is a hot button topic and I'm here tonight 
I'm understanding that changes can be made up to and including tonight. So with that being said, if I see a clear path tonight, I'm willing to take that language off the proper amendment and just leave it state that our normal operating hours are from 6 to 10 p.m. There'll be no restrictions. That's helpful. Mr. McCutch, may, yes, sir. May, may, may I get you to further refine that? 6 to 6 a.m., 10 p.m., Monday through Friday? Perhaps. No major holidays. I will cite it for you, sir. As soon as I find it. Normal hours of operation for the portion of property north of Chapel Road shall be 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Monday through Friday. No operation shall take place on any major holiday. Thank you. The, rain, the remainder of that paragraph will be stricken. Any questions, anyone? I'm assuming lighting will go hand in hand. Lighting will go hand in hand with that. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, is this the time to uh, address the closing or after comments? We, we, it's a public hearing is still open. Okay. If we, we're happy to hear anything that you all would like to present, and we'll give you an opportunity to address the comments you may hear in the public hearing. So if you have other things or if you want to wait until that period, it's up I'll, to you. I'll wait. I'll wait. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, this is a public hearing. Would anyone like to comment concerning rezoning application 05-17? If there is, if you'd come forward, share your name, magisterial district, and try to limit your comments to three minutes or less, please, sir. My name is Richard Dye. I own uh, 65 Richard, acres. Uh, pull, pull that mic. There you I, go. I own 65 acres adjacent to the uh, Carmoose property, and I share a boundary with them of over 4,000 feet. And over a thousand feet of it is the center of Middle Marsh Brook. It's on the southeast side of their property, and I've been asking for specific language about uh, the, the burn being 30 feet high. I wanted it to be 30 feet high, like they agreed to 10 years ago, and tonight they've said that this qualifying language has been removed, which I think that's a good thing. However, I have always asked that it be built 10 years in advance like they agreed to in 08. At that time, it was presented that uh, building the berms 10 years in advance and planting trees and vegetation allows more time for the trees to grow, and this is a good thing. I don't understand why that's no longer a good thing. I still support building uh, the berm 10 years in advance, planting the trees 10 years in advance, and allowing time to grow in. I have seen this in my neighborhood. New development gets built near me. They plant trees. They're now 40 feet high. This is a good thing. Uh, I Please uh, consider why 10 years of time to, for the trees to grow in was a good thing then, but it is no longer a good thing. I, I ask you to, to support the requirement for 10 years in advance for the trees to grow. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Is this your iPad up here? No, that's yours? Okay. There you go. Thank you. I'm Robin Young, Back Creek property owner and a granddaughter of a coal miner who knows a thing or two about the honor of minor companies. I'm also the niece of an uncle who fought with Patton in Belgium. And so I'm glad to see that there's a little less pushing around of the Americans who liberated Belgium in World War II going on tonight. On to my specific remarks, I want to thank the board for the four-week extension that they gave to the neighbors. The time was well used to educate the neighbors to research the science behind sound and blast waves and particulate distribution, and to educate the homeowners that some of the numbers the quarry gave us were misleading. Dozens of signed petitions were passed in to you requesting 30-foot berms and activating the proffer offers of well and engineering studies. 
The present version of the proffer is a partial improvement as it exceeds to some requests we've been making for six months. However, I still think there's some confusion. There's an internal conflict between section 2.2 and 12.2 on the wording of the tree line. Um, they contradict each other as they're currently written. And if, if the current tree line is 100 feet and they're preserving it at 60 feet, that is a 40% reduction in the tree line, which is something the neighbors have fought. I think we need to resolve those two sections of language and determine which they really mean. And I'm, I'm hoping that they really mean the present 100 feet. If one dead tree has to be cut down, that's neither here nor there. If you cut out 40 feet of trees, that makes a difference. When I stood before you last time, I was a messenger from Cliff Balderson at VDOT requesting you to invite them to comment. That has not happened. I must editorialize here that as a transplanted Californian, I'm well aware that Caltrans would have been involved not as an afterthought, but right up front in planning the physical layout of major developments. I find it really odd that when I built my house in Frederick County, I had to buy a permit from VDOT to locate where my driveway intersects with the street, and they control that connection in a major way. But on a major development like this, they have no role up front. So I ask you more directly this time, if you will agree together before the night is over to call them in as part of your resolution. We need to know where the quarry outlets will intersect a winding chapel road. So perhaps a two week delay to consult with VDOT would pay great benefits. Thank you for your time. I will reserve my remaining time for later. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Kristen Lays. I'm the executive director at Belgrove Plantation. It's operated by Belgrove Incorporated, which is a nonprofit organization, and the property is owned by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Um, I sent a letter earlier this week that I hope you all received in your packets. Um, and we just, we are very appreciative of the Board of Supervisors for encouraging community conversation. We're extremely um, glad that we've had an open dialogue for many years, uh, both with Belgrove and the National Trust, but also, also the National Park, Cedar Creek and Belgrove National Historical Park, with representatives of Carmus. Um, as they've stated before, they have worked to be good communicators and be, to be good neighbors. Um, however, Although we are very pleased to see that these proffers have been expanded and have begun to address the concerns of the neighbors, um, since it is actionable by law, we felt that Bell Grove's historic resources also needed to be protected and written into the proffers and be actionable by law. Um, and that would include pre-blast surveys of our historic structures. We've made significant investments in the restoration and preservation of those structures um, in the past year and we're about to embark on a $1.1 million improvement to our property. So uh, feeling the blasts are a very big concern to us. Um, and if a seismograph is gonna be installed north of Chapel Road, we would respectfully ask that one be installed on our historic property as well. So I'm happy to answer any questions you would have. I'm sorry, Thanks. we can't do that one. Oh, okay, Thanks. thank you. Good evening, my name is Kevin Barrington. I live in the Back Creek District. Um, I'm gonna, again, restate what I've said, I don't know how many times since we've, we've been coming here, that um, there's nothing that makes sense about this whole rezoning bit. And uh, for us, to, to ask us to get behind this new revised proffers or any proffers that they give us is like asking us to choose what death we want. Do we want it fast or do we want it slow? Um, that's the way I equate it. And uh, looking through their newly revised stuff about the seismic stuff. Um, I, I'm a little disheartened by the fact, because I, I have told them at numerous occasions about how much my house rocks from, their, from the blasting that's two miles away right now. And um, I'm a little disheartened by the fact that they get to choose, or a licensed professional gets to choose where that seismic monitor goes. Uh, I think, honestly, if you ask them, I think they're afraid to come on my property to put it there, because I think the readings would be off the charts. I have, uh, I've got some existing damage right now that um, 
I'm in the process of, of, of trying to get fixed. So, um, but that's neither here nor there. So I just ask you guys to keep in, in consideration that you saw the, the time frames in which they can work. I was a public servant for 27 years um, and as a police officer in, in Fairfax County and we would go to calls um, of noise ordinance violations that are gonna be less noisy than what we're gonna have to deal with at 10 o'clock at night. So I ask you, just because where we live and where it's zoned, um, should we have to still put up with that stuff at 10 o'clock at night? Um, if, if, it, if it is approved or when it's approved or what have you, um, I just wanna let you know, I, I'm gonna be the one that's gonna to carry the banner, carry the flag to try to get some new legislation in the county to, um, you know, for noise ordinance, for us to be covered in that noise ordinance policy that you guys have in effect right now. It needs to be changed, it needs to protect us. This doesn't protect us at all. So I thank you for your time and uh, I to uh, await your decision. Thank you much. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Yes. Can I come back? Well, let's make sure we don't have anyone else and we certainly will do that. Right. Anyone else like to comment? Yes, sir. Hello, my name is uh, Kean Banks and I'm in the Back Creek District. Um, I want to appreciate, I want to say I appreciate you guys is taking the time to let us have the last few months to negotiate and work with these guys. Um, I believe George, I believe he's, he's uh, an honest guy who is trying to work with us as best as he can. Um, he's, he's serving two masters and that's, that's not an easy chore. Um, I also want to uh, appreciate Mr. Dunn and Mr. Lofton for working uh, on negotiations for us and for Carmus to get us to a, a place that uh, seems like it's going to be working. I know that they turned in language earlier in the week uh, that we read over and looked at and said, ooh, not so beautiful. And, and, and I hear that the language is gonna change. And, and with that change of language, I think we've, we've come a long way. Um, but I, I, turning in that language in the 12th hour, I still haven't been able to read it and, and see if uh, the language matches what's been said. And I know, um, We've had issues in the past with the language not matching what we were working with. And so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that if there's going to be a vote tonight, um, if, if we could delay it for two weeks so the people can read that language that has been changed at the last minute, I do believe at this point in time they are going to, 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 to that, that wording will be in there and it will be a, an agreement that we can all um, make our best with. And again, I thank you guys and I thank these guys. They are, we, we have made a lot of headway and I think that's huge. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Good evening, my name is Ed Stroin. I live on Western View Drive in the Back Creek District. And again, I want to add my thanks to all of you to allow the uh, discussions to have taken place over the last couple of months and, and weeks. Uh, I have not seen the final edits except for tonight. They're an improvement over the previous iteration uh, that was passed around at the beginning of the week. Uh, in my mind, all of these changes, including the final ones, are infinitely better than the original 2008 proffers. Uh, if by waiting another week or two to smooth out language, close up ambiguities and so forth, uh, at this point, uh, two weeks is two weeks. You know, what, let's spend another two weeks and clear up everything so that uh, all of us can feel that it's the best of a bad circumstance. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Would anyone else like to speak? Anyone at all? Last call. Yes, ma'am. So 
So Robin Young, Back Creek. Finishing up on VDOT quickly, I wanted to add that I think at this point we especially need VDOT more than ever because in the current proffer, kind of sliding by, is a line that says um, they reserve the right to light any of their equipment at night. And we know there's talk of an, of an overhead conveyor belt crossing chapel aerially, and that would be lit under this proffer. And that's never been discussed, which is something we need to take a bit of a look at. Um, I'm also, when I'm done here, I'm gonna hand the clerk of the board a, uh, a page from the Carmuse website, which is titled Neighbor Relationships. And in this, they talk about how in Belgium, they insulate the rock crushers to minimize the noise to the neighboring community. Um, that has not been offered to us nor discussed. And so if insulation is good enough for Belgium, it should be good enough for Frederick County. So I would ask that at some point, somebody at the county ask them about that. I next want to mention briefly the, um, the seismographs and the petitions. The petitions we gave you asked for 30 seismographs. Now, that is a bit excessive. I do think we could probably um, compromise on something less, but Carmuse offered one. They knew the petitions were out there, they offered one. It's a decidedly puny counter offer and it's really not acceptable. The miles of terrain over which the quarry stretches contains different subsoil conditions. Folded limestone will react differently than acid shale beds, alluvial soils and floodplains. They really need to put a seismograph in each one of those geologic formations. I think we could compromise on four. Belgrove is on the plain, they could have one, one on Western View where the shaking has been extreme at four miles away from the quarry, one on a ridge zone like Chimney Hills, and one in the Great Bowl that kind of sits below the Kesak's house and there's a whole bunch of houses perched on the rim of that bowl. That would be solid scientific information with seismographs, so I would suggest that. I'm also very pleased at the removal of what I consider the poison pill, the uh, 5 a.m. to 11 p.m. hours, which would have made that neighborhood be like living in a special army base, a special forces army base. So I think that's a great improvement, very pleased by that tonight. Again, thanks to Supervisor Lofton and Supervisor Dunn for all the uh, footwork. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else like a second opportunity? All right, we'll close the public comment portion. Gentlemen, if you'd like to respond to any of the comments you've heard, you're welcome to. Yes, sir. Uh, first and foremost, uh, regarding the berm question in, in question at the uh, 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 first gentleman speaking, uh, that berm is at a 30 foot height. It is proffered, we can pull that up. Uh, secondly, the conflict with the tree line, that tree line is remaining at its original and that is pro in the proffers as well. Uh, with respect to Belgrove, uh, there is a current seismograph next door to Belgrove, a permanent one. Uh, this can also address, address the most recent comment about having 30 seismographs. That's redundancy. That would be like putting a seismograph between each one of us here. So with that being said, there's one at Belgrove. DMME will require us to have one at the nearest dwelling and we are offering a stationary one. So there'll be three in this area. Uh, and finally, I'd like to also address the uh, uh, hours of operation and, and the two week delay. We've kicked this can down the road long enough. This is all on public record. I have stated to you not more than 20 minutes ago that I will remove that language. That language will be removed. Having said that, in closing folks, like many of you, we are business associates. We feel this is our best outcome and opportunity for all. We provide jobs and income for many, and more importantly, we provide a lifestyle. Just a couple of notes to leave with you tonight. Most of you, if not all, drove here tonight in your car or truck. 
Did you know that there's 100 pounds of our material in your car? Each and every car on the road requires 100 pounds of our material. On a more personal note, last week, we had an employee celebrate 50 years, 50 year anniversary at our, at our Middletown operation. That's quite an accomplishment. We would like nothing more to have more employees celebrate anniversaries with Carmoose. Thank you, we look forward to your vote and we will respect the outcome. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank everyone for coming out tonight and sharing your views. And thank Carmuse for coming out and actually working up till the 12th hour to help get this uh, as possibly close as we can. And I think, I actually think, I don't know what other refinements we could make that would make a huge difference or even a small difference in this. Um, for the sake of the discussion, let me make a motion to approve the proper amendments um, as submitted as of this afternoon for the Carmoose Owen Minerals Company. Um, again, uh, as the amended proper's as stated today, the latest version of today, I would move for approval of that. Only on the proverbs, you're not speaking to the request? I'm sorry? You're not speaking to the request, but only the proper statement? For the request, yes. So you're moving for approval of rezoning 0517? Yeah. Okay, just one to make sure. Uh, the, the rezoning with the amended proper yes. Thank you. yes. So I've heard the motion, is there a second? I'll second it, Mr. Chairman. I'll second it for the purpose of discussion. All right, we have a second. It's time for discussion. Mr. Chairman, um, I'm, I'm completely uncomfortable with voting on this tonight as it stands, mostly because of what some of the constituents stated that I just received the amended proffers when I walked in here this evening, and I think this affects way too many families for me to vote on it right now. So. Um, I would not support your motion, Mr. Lofton, and I would actually make a, make my own motion, can I do that? To postpone it until June 13th. No, um, not Lofton, there's another motion. You okay. can offer an amendment to postpone. Sure, then I'll offer an amendment to Mr. Lofton's mo motion to postpone this vote until June the 13th so that the citizens can have a chance to review the proffers as well. And do you intend to keep the public hearing open as part of that motion? Yes. Thank you. I've heard the motion. Is there a second? Second, Mr. Chairman. And the second by Supervisor Slaughter. Discussion. Mr. Chairman, um, it, uh, Ms. Perkins laid out what was given to you in your packet. Uh, Mr. McCotch explained those refinements to the arguments against that latest uh, proper amendment. I don't know, in my mind, certainly, I don't think that, that we need to postpone this one more time. Um, it, it's, it's either yes or no tonight. That's what I'd like to see. Uh, we worked, and I will give credit to Mr. McCotch uh, and his co-staff there that uh, I've not asked for anything that I have not been given, that Yes, there are times we have disagreed, and there's still times, that, still things that we might just have a slight disagreement on, but they have been very forthcoming with me. If they couldn't give me an answer, if it had to come from a higher level in the corporation, they did that, they get back to me. Uh, we have made, and I think, uh, some great concessions here. I don't know that we'll get it any closer and I really don't think people want to go back to the 2008 proffers. So I would vote against the delay. All right, further discussion on the proposed delay 
Mr. Chairman, um, in, in response to Supervisor Lofton's um, uh, remarks, I am very grateful for the time and the effort that both you and Supervisor Dunn have put into this, but it gives me pause to receive something when I walk in here that evening um, and not have a chance to thoroughly read it and to also give the residents an opportunity to make sure that it it fulfills. It sounds like you've made great strides. I, I really and truly like the fact that there is a smaller footprint in all of this, um, and it, it, it seems to be a more workable um, um, improvement. However, I do think it's important that um, we do have an opportunity to read and digest it, and for, um, I know in our packets we've We've seen redlined remarks of those revisions um, by the county attorney, so for me to feel comfortable with it, and again, I, I am not taking anything away from all of your hard work, and I know you have tirelessly worked um, to try to get us to this point, as has Supervisor done. So I'm most appreciative of that. Okay, further discussion on the proposed amendment? Anyone? Mr. Chairman. Supervisor Lofton. Does the applicant have any say in whether or not this post one may go there? Okay. May I address one more time? No, sir. Mr. Chairman. Are you ready? May yes. May I ask? Um, it, there have been comments this evening about the VDOT issue, and I guess as has been customarily um, received, we have received VDOT comments, so <coughs> I. I don't know if there's any clarification that anyone could offer as to why um, we, we haven't received VDOT comments. I'm sorry, the what? The VDOT comments, there, there have been a couple of issues raised about VDOT comments, and I know as is typical with, with that, uh, with a zoning of some sort, we, we, we do have that preview. Right, with this rezoning, since the proffer amendments didn't pertain to any of the previously proffered VDOT commitments, Typically, when VDOT's not being impacted with the revision, we don't seek additional comments because okay. all the commitments from the 2006 to now have not changed. Very well, thank you. If I may, surely to follow up on that, uh, I actually contacted VDOT. Uh, obviously, Chapel Road cannot be used for any type of commercial use, hauling rock in or out of that quarry area on either side, north or south. The VDOT will allow them, when they're building the berms, to cross Chapel Road only a certain number of times. They're, they're not gonna give them carte blanche that they can keep doing that forever. And that they would, like I say, there is a tunnel proposed, they would uh, actually consider a conveyor system. And according to Mr. Ingram, uh, that would probably be a dis that would probably be the way they would want them to go, but that decision is not gonna be made now until actually Carmuse says that's what we would like to do. So again, VDOT, uh, there's not a whole lot that they're saying except you're not gonna use Chapel Road for any kind of commercial hauling. You can cross the road a certain number of times or a certain time period to get that work done, but then that's it. Thank you. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Anyone? Supervisor Dunn. Mr. Chairman and fellow board, board members, McC Mr. McCotch and his team have been extremely helpful, reasonable, and have tried to work with the community. I think he's a reasonable gentleman who's tried to reasonably solve a very difficult problem. The revised proper is something that I like. My concern is on the items that were eliminated. And that's the problem that I'm wrestling with. And there's a disagreement among attorneys on whether that, on the effect of that elimination. Um, so if this proper had simply been the reduced footprint as outlined on the boards, with the other revisions here, none of which are perfect, I think it's a improvement. 
For those that are concerned on berms, the 20 foot berms behind within approximately a year, Carmos will be down another 15 feet. So now you have 20 feet berms and, 30, and 15 feet down, so you have a 35 foot situation. Mr. McCotch has said verbally that if they eliminated trees, they would go and plant those trees. I appreciated those comments. They were an effort to try to work with people. And if this proposal simply dealt with the berms and did not eliminate anything else, it would be a much easier vote. So I think Mr. McCock is doing the, as somebody else said, he has two masters. I really appreciate the work that you put into this. I appreciate the time you gave me. I appreciate the time we spent. I will tell you right now, this is a difficult vote. And for all of you listening, because of the current proffer law, it is very difficult to have a discussion the way normal people would have. And that makes this a reason why this proper law, also in my opinion, should be revised by the General Assembly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Further discussion, anyone? Mr. Chairman, if I may. Supervisor Lawson. To the point of being redundant, I received uh, a list from several people of 11 items that they would like to see addressed. And again, Mr. Dunn, myself, and Mr. Markach, and his staff have worked, um, and I'd like to kind of go through these. Number one, all, eight, all 2008 properties regarding planted vegetation remain the same, naval water and care. They've actually gone above and beyond that. Um, they're, they're actually adding plants in addition to the plantings that are required by Arizona code. And so I think that's a plus. They leave the natural tree buffer along Western View. As we've heard, they're gonna leave 60% of that tree buffer along Western View, which I think is a huge. Or a plant uh, more. The limit, of op limit hours of operation to daytime shift north of Chapel, we got very close to that. As you heard Mr. McCott say, they're willing to say, they're gonna limit the hours Monday through Friday, no major holidays. Uh, no rock crushers are processing of any kind. There's not gonna be any processing north of Chapel Road. That's all extraction and moving the material to the south where it will be processed. Um, all overburden, all quarry operations must be contained within the established berms that's in here. There's no parking outside of the berms. The only time they can be outside those berms is when they're doing maintenance or some exploratory drilling for some reason or some other type of activity that has to be done and finished. They can't park it out there on, they just can't park it out there. All overburden piles, waste beads shall be no higher than the berms, that's in here. All lighting shall be mounted below berms and pointed down. The, the lighting is in here. There's actually gonna turn the lighting off after work hours, which was not in there before. Permanent seismograph readers shall be immediately installed for homes that request them. Um, I've, I've talked with people who have expertise in this area and they tell me that that's a fallacy, really, because you could have seismic gas in front of two houses. One might show some activity and the other might not show any activity. So then you're arguing, well, something happened to my house and I can prove it because there was a, uh, activity on my neighbors. So they're offering beyond what they have to offer according to the Mines and Minerals, Department of Mines, Minerals and Energy. Um, the three wells immediately installed. They're gonna install the three wells that stays in there and they will have one well that will be installed within six months if these proper amendments are approved. Um, the, the building of the berm should be completed two years before mining starts North of Chapel. Uh, that's it. And they want a new smaller footprint. The 30 foot berm on the east side is 30 foot berm. It doesn't say we're gonna adjust the height, we can't meet the cemetery or the stream or anything else. That's a 30 foot berm. So, and if one more thing that Mr. McCotch did not bring up that I think it's a plus, but it's not in the proffers, and this has been discussed with several homeowners. If the berms do not protect the view shed of the homes, trees will be planted if requested on the homeowner's property that will screen the operations from that property. 
So that was not in the propers, but that is something that McCarmuse has offered to do. If this is approved, they will send out letters to all whose view shed might be uh, affected by that. So even the, the petitions that we've seen have not greatly deviated from this. And I'm, I'm not taking either side here. I'd like for the, the residents to be as protected as possible while allowing Carmuse as much flexibility as they can to continue to be uh, a taxpaying organization in this county. So that's why I will vote against. It's time we, we make a decision. I will vote against the postponement. Further discussion, Supervisor McCarthy. Mr. Chairman, I've been sitting listening. I was really hopeful that when we tabled this back in March that we'd be sitting here tonight making a decision one way or the other. Um, I'm disappointed that we're not. Um, I understand why we're not though and I appreciate all the hard work that's gone into the development of the compromises that have been put before us tonight. Unfortunately, the last proper amendment was done or the revision was done March 2nd if you look on this amended proper statement, the latest one was May 23rd, which we're sitting in May 23rd right now. And I think it's unreasonable to expect any legislator of any level of government to be handed something five minutes before they're asked to vote on it with no time to read or consider it. I think it sort of flies in the face of having a public comment period if the public hasn't had a chance to even see the document that they're going to be commenting on. Um, it's unfortunate, I was really hoping we could put this to bed tonight, but I think out of fairness and due process, um, I'm, I'm going to support uh, Shannon's amend, amended motion. Supervisor Slaughter. Um, just one last comment, and that was in regard to the letter that we also received at our stations this evening from Bell Grove. And that was in regard to Proffer 8.1 about conducting pre blast surveys um, at Bell Grove. Is that a part? Because I'm not sure that it specifically addresses anything beyond the residents. Um, th this proper amendment. That, as yeah. I understand it, that's that's ongoing now, right? Correct. Okay. This is board discussion. And and also the request for notification for blasting, that is an ongoing. They would be a part of the notification for blasting as well. The blasting and the the. Um, Pre -blast Mr. Chairman, if, if I may, that's one thing I did um, omit from my comments is number 11, they wanted set times for blasting, but the way the propers are written now that any homeowner can notify Carmuse uh, uh, to allow them to contact them in a timely manner as to when the next blast is going to be and that is by text message, email, phone call, whatever method you choose to have, Carmoose has agreed in the proffers to set up a system where they will notify you before any blasting takes place. The set times for blasting were hard to do because that could depend upon the weather and so many other factors. So it, it can't be a set time for the blasting uh, and I understand that, but you will be notified prior to any blast if you so choose and you contact Carmuse and it will be done with your preferred method. All right, further discussion, anyone? One of the comments, Mr. Chairman. Those are done. As I said earlier, I think this is a improved proffer. And the one thing I'm struggling with is that certain sections of the, 2000, of the previous proffer were deleted. And if those items were left in, even though there may be another set of paperwork that in some opinion may negate that, would make it a non-issue. And so that's the issue that um, is difficult. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Anyone at all? We're voting on the amended motion to delay to the 13th of June um, and holding the public hearing open until that time. Supervisor McCarthy. Aye. Supervisor Slaughter. Aye. Supervisor Lofton. No. Supervisor Dunn. 
Aye. Supervisor Trout? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. This discussion will be delayed until our 613-18 meeting and the public hearing will remain open. We thank you all for all your hard work. That will bring us to a discussion on St. Paul's on the Hill comp plan amendment. Ms. Perkins. Again, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. This is a requested amendment to the Sensi Eastern Frederick Urban Area Plan of the 2035 Comprehensive Plan. Now, this is a 4.9 acre property located at 1527 Sensini Road. Now, the current zoning of this property is RP, residential performance, and is located within the sewer water service area and the urban development area. Now, the comprehensive plan currently shows this property with an institutional land use. Now, that land use is reflective of the current uh, church on the property, and that area adjacent to it is a school, so that also has the institutional land use. The site is also surrounded by residential and the Greenwood Urban Center. And they are seeking, as I stated, to amend the comp plan from institutional to urban center. If I can direct you to the screen on your left, the subject property is outlined in black in this location, and you have Sensony Road. And that yellow is all of the existing RP residential, and the pink is a B1 neighborhood business district. And this is just a snapshot of the existing comprehensive plan that shows the current planned land use. You have this area here, which is the institutional, and this yellow hatched area is residential. And then you have the existing limits of the urban center, which is the little circles, which are across Sensony Road, as well as adjacent in this little flag area here. Now this is the land use that they are requesting. They are seeking to move that urban center to cover their property. And I know this is a lot of <laughs> colors up there, but this is just to show where the limits of the Greenwood Urban Center are. You have Sensony Road in this location, and this is that core um, gr uh, Greenwood area, and that subject property is located here. Now, as I stated, the subject property is currently zoned RP, residential performance. The current buy right density of that site, if developed with a townhouse or garden apartment type use, would be 10 units per acre. So with the 4.9 acres, that would be 49 buy right units. The expansion of the urban center designation to the property would double the buy right density because of the housing type, high density residential, allows for 20 units an acre if you're in a neighborhood center or an urban village. So that would take the property from 10 to 20 for multifamily. So the density would be increased as a buy right use allowance. It would not require rezoning to address any impacts. So potentially you could have an increase of 50 units with the doubling of the density. Now just a side note, um, the site does have some development constraints such as the riparian buffer and the zoning district buffers that would be required, which could potentially limit the density. And we would note that the applicant is currently seeking some ordinance amendments that would provide relief to the dent to the constraints to help with the density they are seeking. That's just a side note that would come later under the ordinance committee. So background, this was discussed at the Comprehensive Plans and Programs Committee at their April 2018 meeting. They supported the request and sent it to the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission discussed this at their May 2nd meeting and also supported the amendment and sent it forward to the board. So tonight we are seeking a decision from the board on whether this is ready to be sent forward to public hearing. I'll be glad to answer any questions. And Mr. Evan Wyatt with Greenway Engineering is here on behalf of the applicant. Questions for Ms. Perkins, anyone? Sure. Supervisor McCarthy. Ms. Perkins, um, this has been presented to, I believe the planning commissioning to us as a community that will be developed for 55 and better senior type of living community. Would this type of approval to an amendment to the um, plan guarantee that that's the type of use it would be for, or could it be also by right use for other uh, constituencies? But with this, there wouldn't be there wouldn't be a county regulation for the use of the property, so it could be age restricted. It could be open to all ages. That's not mm -hmm. something that would be covered under a comprehensive plan amendment. Thank you. Anyone else, Supervisor Lofton? A uh, couple of questions. Number one, I'm assuming that when we go from a property that needs to be rezoned to a by right use and we double the density, 
with that by right use, we have no way to capture impacts on any infrastructure. Uh, and if we had propers, they would not have to offer any propers to build on that particular piece of property. In other words, it, would, would they have to improve right. Centennial Road if it showed that there was? Right. With, with the rezoning, they would have to seek agency comments and they would have to mitigate the impacts that they have. So to, you, they would have a VDOT comment, they would have a you know, parks and rec, they would have a, a planning, they would have all the agency comments that are typical with a rezoning application. Okay. Well, that answers my second question. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Mr. Chairman. Are done. The vote tonight is ascended to public hearing at the Planning Commission, not at the Board of Supervisors. Is that correct? correct. Okay. Supervisor Slaughter. Um, Mrs. Perkins, is there a way to preserve the mission, as I understand it, of St. Paul's on the Hill to provide um, age restricted uh, facility without um, making a rezoning or some other avenue other than the comp plan amendment to upscale it to a UD? The only assurance the county would have for an age restricted development would be a rezoning that assured it that the complement amendment would not be able to do that. And, and would we be able to um, entertain both a rezoning and the comp plan amendment at the same time? They could be prof processed concurrently. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, I, have, I, I do have one last question. Since this property is currently zoned RP, as I understand it, it's been a many, many years ago that, that it took on this form of um, uh, density. Do you recall what year this was originally rezoned for its current, current state? The property would have been shown on the 1964 zoning map as either R1, R2, R3. All of those were consolidated to the RP district in 1990. So it's, it's had an RP, even though it had the same land use back in the 1964 maps. And it would have allowed then the 10 units per acre. Um, Barring any ordinance amendments that have changed the density. The right. Okay, thank you so much. Anyone else? So given <clears throat> the rezoning was being considered, is there a way to get to their density within our current zoning ordinance? There are two options. One is, is if they wanted to do the age-restricted multifamily housing, that would take a rezoning because it has to be in a proffered age-restricted development that does have a density of 20 units per acre. The only other way to get them the density they want is the comp plan amendment to do the other housing type. That's what I was looking for. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Just, just, re Roger Dunn. just repeat your first comment, please. The comp plan amendment, and then just slowly walk through what was your first comment, yeah. please. The comp plan amendment would give them the allowance of 20 units an acre right, if they, because they want to develop with the high density residential multifamily housing type. The other option to still get the 20 units an acre is to rezone to age restricted, which would allow them to still do 20 units an acre with the age restricted multifamily housing. Thank They're you. two different housing types. Thank you. Other questions, Ms. Perkins? Thank you. So the request is whether or not we feel it's ready to send forward to public hearing. So that's what we're being asked to decide this evening. And Mr. Wyatt is also here. Yes, I'm sorry. Mr. Wyatt, thank you, sir. <laughs> you know, that wasn't intentional. I know that. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I'm Evan Wyatt with Greenway Engineering, uh, representing St. Paul's in this request. Um, just a very quick uh, snapshot of, of the proposal. Um, St. Paul's, as Supervisor McCann Slaughter said, is a mission church, and what they desire to do is to advocate housing for elderly, uh, lower income residents of the community. And I think this is really a uh, benefit and an important opportunity uh, for this population of our community because conventional developers just don't build this kind of housing because there's no profit in it. 
okay? So it does take a partnership uh, such as St. Paul uh, working with a development partner, which in this instance is Wesley Housing Development Corporation, uh, to make something like this happen. Um, the ability to do the project uh, very simply is to uh, raise the existing church, to build a new St. Paul's church that's oriented closer to Cincinnati Road that is connected to a four-story building uh, that's intended to be designed to provide for 59 one-bedroom units and 11 two-bedroom units uh, for elderly residents. Um, the interesting thing about this property, of course, it's in the sewer and water service area and the urban development area, and it's already zoned for residential use, is the fact that this particular housing product type that is needed to serve this type of population cannot be developed simply because the comprehensive plan doesn't designate the property being in the urban center similar to properties directly across the road that are zoned RP, properties to the immediate east, and then, as Candace said, the larger center. Um, so the purpose of the comp plan amendment is to allow for St. Paul's to move forward with Wesley Housing uh, to get the, the opportunity to do this project. The, um, the, it seems like the conundrum that the county is struggling with is the ability to control the property to ensure that what we say is gonna happen is gonna happen. Um, and, and I understand that to a degree. Um, but a couple things that uh, we need to make sure we understand. First of all, uh, I do agree that the only guarantee from the county's perspective to guarantee that it is an age restricted is to proffer a age restricted product. So unfortunately, the problem with that is an age restricted multifamily residential unit requires a 100 foot setback going internally to the property from the property lines. Our property is 250 feet in width. We can't build the facility with, with that type of age restricted multifamily user. The other thing is um, obviously, presumably it's an opportunity to, to seek monetary proffers as an example. But when you think about this particular project, um, because of the specifically attributable impacts legislation and what monetary proffers can be accepted for by the county, uh, there are no impacts to schools. Uh, there are no capital projects for Greenwood Volunteer Fire and Rescue and so on and so forth. So any opportunity for monetary proffers would be very minuscule, if at all. Um, so it, it begs the question, if you take the leap of faith and do what St. Paul is, is re re requesting, how do you guarantee they're going to keep their end of the bargain? Other than the fact, of course, we, we certainly believe what St. Paul says they're going to do. Uh, but, the, but the real answer is this. St. Paul's is the landowner, and they will continue to be the landowner. They will land lease the area in which the facility is going to be constructed to Wesley Housing, who will be responsible for construction, for ownership, for maintenance, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And the uh, land lease that the church will establish with them is a 99-year land lease that will say, our property is only allowed to be used for a facility that is in support of our mission, which is elderly affordable income housing. So, so you do have that ability to guarantee that what they're saying they're gonna do, they're gonna do. Um, this is kind of a, a quirky situation where it's the first time in my career I'm, I'm remembering when property is zoned, but you have to point back to the comp plan to, to do a project, but it is what it is. Um, but with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Questions for Mr. Wyatt, anyone? I have one. Supervisor Dunn. Mr. Wyatt, um, on the 99-year lease, if the church sold the property for whatever reason, they decide to move, et cetera, what happens then? Does that, does that if they build the building, they have a 99-year lease with certain restrictions, does that still stay or not? Or if the land is sold? Well, once again, the, the the St. Paul's, the ability for them to sustain and maintain their operations on the property, because as you know, the existing facility is a 50 year old building and so on and so forth. They're part of the whole. They are there, they are part, that's where their church will be and it will be attached to and part of the building. 
Uh, so they would not have any intentions to sell the property under this scenario. Second question, Mr. Chairman. You made the comment about proffers and Greenwood is a mile, less than a mile away. Mm -hmm. And then you made the comment about capital projects. So if there were, if there were a rezoning, would proffers cover somebody needing to take, be taken to the hospital? No, or, sir. An or, or an emergency? No, sir. Can you, just, can you then describe what the proffers would cover if they sure. the uh, The monetary contributions to the county are <coughs> intended to provide by state legislation uh, support for capital projects that the county is being burdened with and, and therefore assessing the taxpayers, such as building a new school. Um, with Greenwood, they're, they're not, the county does not have on their CIP that they are proposing to build a new Greenwood fire hall. Uh, the equipment needs, I know that there's a very minor line item budget in the county that is, you know, that goes across the board for all the volunteer companies, and that's about it. Um, of course, with this particular project, um, and, and then the other thing too, of, of course, the, it was a struggle several years ago, uh, but I believe all, if, if maybe all but one, uh, of the volunteer fire companies chose to go for fee for service uh, for that type of support. So there is a revenue uh, for that use. Um, so once again, if, if you're talking about monetary proffers, it really doesn't go towards the, the operation side of, of things. It's really more uh, capital facilities cost. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Anyone else? Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Mr. President McCarthy. Mr. White, you mentioned that uh, one of the restrictions for rezoning and doing a 55 and better community is that setback requirement. Could they not apply for variance for that setback? Um, so, first of all, it's not a it's not a 55 and older community. It would be uh, the the financing, the agreement, the building would be strictly for elderly income qualified residents. And uh, I'm not going to get too deep in the weeds in the funding formula but you take the average uh, income value of a single person in this community, and in order to be able to qualify to live in this facility, you have to be at 60% or less of the income of the average. So if the average income for a single person was $30,000, you would be making eight or $22,000 or less in order to qualify to be here. So it's not your typical 55 and older community. It's, it's really earmarked for a section of our population that needs this type of housing. So to follow up on that, would there be potential for folks under the age of 55 that would qualify for housing within the community? Um, that's not what St. Paul's is looking for. Um, I may have to ask Mr. Paul Brown with Wesley Housing to further address that because they've done several of these projects. And, and I'd, li I'd like to hear that, but before he addresses that, could you answer the first question, which was, could they not apply for a variance? On oh, I'm setback? sorry. Um, well, we could certainly make an application for a variance, but the, but the first question would be, what is the, what is the hardship? Mm -hmm. um, why can't you do what you do? And, and we could certainly utilize practical difficulty because of the configuration of the lot. But I think in the truest spirit of a variance approval, uh, they're not obligated to grant us a variance if you can make use of the property for some other purpose, which you could. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so thank you. Uh, my name is Paul Brown. I'm the Vice President of Real Estate for Wesley Housing. So um, we plan, uh, we hope to uh, develop this project and would finance it with low-income housing tax credits, which is a, uh, a federal subsidy administered by the state agency and we would covenant to the state agency that we would reserve the property for uh, elderly, uh, which in this case would mean 62 or older. Thank you. Other questions of Mr. Brown? Anyone? Thank you, sir. Mr. Wyatt. Yes, there's other, other questions. questions for Mr. Wyatt. Anyone? Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Supervisor Slaughter. May I ask Mrs. Perkins? Another please, question, if you please. Would. And I, I just want to be sure I understand in regard to uh, Mr. Wyatt's uh, response about the variance. Um, if we simultaneously um, move forward with a rezoning and the change to the UD, but maybe we don't don't need the UD since what 
I think I understood you to say is with the rezoning, we would be able to um, be able to obtain the number of units they want per acre, which was 20. Is that correct? If they rezoned and did the high density, the age restricted multifamily housing, but following up on that, a variance wouldn't be the proper channel. That it would really need an ordinance amendment. Um, so, so you still would need the ordinance amendment yes. irregardless. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, I, I hate to interject, but I, I don't know. I don't see any reason or purpose to do both a comprehensive plan amendment and a rezoning. You would do one or the other. You wouldn't do both. There's no there's no purpose served by doing both. It sounds like they would accomplish the same, which is the density issue, but but the age restriction, if you did the rezoning, would be a part of it. Is that correct? It's, it's really two different things, because there are two different housing types, okay? So you have housing type one, which is age-restricted multifamily housing. That requires a proffer into an age-restricted community. That's, that's one housing type. If they went that way, that's the one they would need some form of change to the setbacks if they want to pursue that one. The second one is that high density residential, which is also 20 units an acre, but that's one that you have to have a comp plan designation to use, so. Which is what the request is. Yeah. I just wanna be sure I'm not being confused in all of this, and, and that is in order to accomplish the mission of the church, which as I understand it, is to provide age-restricted housing. And another part of this, from my comfort level, is in perpetuity. So, so I understand the 99-year lease, but goodness, I, I hope there's many more generations to come. And so I, I, I wonder what would be the best way to go about this? And would it be with a rezoning or with the comp plan amendment? to accomplish the mission of the church, which is age restriction. I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I'm just trying to figure out which is the best way for us to approach this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, that, that did put her on the spot. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, I know it wasn't your intention. <laughs> it wasn't my intention. So, so, the spot. so to, we'll, we'll move on. And try we'll, and help yeah. Ms. Perkins. <laughs> I was trying to do that too. Help. Um, <laughs> The comprehensive plan amendment would enable the church to do what they have stated they want to do. What it doesn't do for the county is give you a guarantee that what happens on that property will be an age-restricted development. That's that's really the crux of it. I think the, the current the current expected financing source would, but you don't know. Right. Thank you. Leslie has a long tradition of, of great respect in the world. So, Supervisor Don? The reason that I had made this proposal initially in February was <coughs> that St. Paul's had come and said that they needed to get certain things done to be in place so they could go for their tax credits, which were going to be in February, I believe. And if they went through the normal process, we wouldn't get through that process. The, the, the amendment process begins like in June. So the, I had offered that as an acceleration to address that issue, just, just so you know. We had, we had, but we did not discuss a rezoning alternative. So they were trying to get this done for this coming year so they could make their application in January of 2019 with mm -hmm. everything in place to do so. That was the purpose behind it as opposed to going through the uh, normal, normal process which would have begun in June. So to follow up on that comment, um, the rezoning time frame would essentially, because we'd have to go through all the agency comments just as you would with a comp plan amendment, essentially we'd be spending, spending the same amount of time without either one. It, it, is that a correct statement? Sim similar time frames, right? now would obviously, obviously be extended out if they wanted to go that route now, but rezoning four to six months if it's expedited on the lower end of that. Okay. I, again, I, I apologize for interjecting, but the, the, um, 
the drawback from, from the applicant's perspective is, as you heard, there are setback issues. So if they do the rezoning, I, I, it's my understanding they're gonna need ordinance amendments to accomplish what they wanna do. So th there's really no ideal path here, quite frankly. Um, that's, that's the situation we find ourselves in. <coughs> And from, from my perspective, you know, it's either send it back to the PC for the public hearing and recommendation to come back through for a decision, send it back to the PC with direction would be preferable to what you want them to look at, um, or send it to public hearing as requested. Other thoughts? Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. First, I want to applaud St. Paul's for what they're trying to do. I think it's a really important thing and it's very much needed. Um, I think the thing that I'm grappling with is the situation that we have in this county where we have an influx of demands on resources and limited ability to pay for those resources. And I believe you 100% when you say that your intention is to put in a 55 and better community. Um, but as a real estate attorney, I've seen many times intentions don't actually come to fruition, not because of any um, intentional point, but by accident sometimes. And I think what we're being asked to do here is increase density by double, which could have potentially the impact of increasing um, children in our schools and things of that nature. Um, for me, it's not about proffers because either way, there's not gonna be a lot of money coming from a proffer anyway. It really boils down to what is the impact going to be on Frederick County? And I think we have a responsibility to minimize negative impact on the county. And then at the other hand, I'm saying, but the positive impact of a facility like this may outweigh that impact. Um, what my concern is at this late stage in the game, um, I'd hate to recommend this back to um, the Planning Commission, knowing that I may vote against this because I don't have any assurances, and waste even more time um, for these folks when they may be able to start another process that could get them where they want to be before their time runs out. So I'm trying to sort of balance um, being careful and um, being sympathetic to their needs. Um, so that's, that's what I'm struggling with right now is whether or not it makes sense to send this back and waste another couple weeks when we could start another procedure or at least get it going in the meantime. Other thoughts, Supervisor Dunn. Mr. McCarthy. Um, I'm empathetic to your concerns. I'll make a motion when we finish discussing this to move it forward. And the intent would be to move it forward, um, knowing that the planning commission can hear additional comments, knowing that the applicant can come back and react to those comments and see where we are. So I, I, I will make a motion to move it forward, um, to see if some of the issues that you've raised, some of the issues that Mrs. Slaughter's raised, um, and see where we are. Motions move it forward to public hearing. Yes. Thank you, sir. Sir, second. Second. And a second. Further discussion. I have one other question for all of you. Are there amendments that you want to put onto this before it goes to a public hearing? If so I'll be. I'll, I'll, I'll list to those. Or because the chairman said direction. So I'm just asking the question. If if we ask the PC to do something, it's helpful to them if we tell them what we'd like for them to look at. But. Okay. I don't know that any of that's necessary. Okay. You would expect them to look at that each and every time they consider anything to move forward for action. Then I would ask the Planning Commission to listen to the comments that are made tonight on the age issue and on the other related issues and try to address them. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? The motion is to move it forward to public hearing. Supervisor Trout. Aye. Supervisor Dunn. Aye. Supervisor Lofton. Aye. Supervisor Slaughter. Aye. Supervisor McCarthy. Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. We forward it to public hearing. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Ms. Perkins. Uh, board liaison reports, are there any? Mr. Chairman. Supervisor Lofton. If I may, uh, we heard tonight where the Social Services Department came in and actually wanted to reduce their budget, which is actually refreshing, isn't it? But unfortunately, uh, in this next week, we may have to turn right around and increase that budget because depending upon the amount of support, if in fact Medicaid expansion is approved, 
depending upon the amount of support you get from federal and state government, we're looking at anywhere from over 400,000 to at least $280,000 in local dollars to make that happen. So I hope that our delegates think long and hard before they make that vote. I certainly hope so. Others, anyone? Mr. Board Chairman. Liaison reports, yes. Ms. Uh, a brief Frederick Water report. Um, they had a public hearing on May 15th, 2018, where they adopted an increase to the water and sewer base rates. They also adopted the 2019 uh, fiscal budget, and they authorized the execution of an agreement that will facilitate the construction of the Stevenson Interceptor. Thank you. Anyone else for liaison reports? Citizen comments on any issue whatsoever that you might like to bring the board's attention? Would anyone? Last chance. Close the public comment portion. Board of Supervisors comment. Mr. Chairman, yes, and, and these comments Supervisor will be, Dunn. These yes. comments will be brief. <coughs> but earlier this evening, we had some people that came and talked about schools. And of those people not here at the moment, perhaps they can listen to this you know, discussion. Three of us went to Brambleton in Loudoun County to try to get a better feel for other options. All of us have gone and tried to do a lot of work to try to make the best decision for everybody in Frederick County. In Loudoun, there's a brand new school that's been open for one year that was built for approximately $54 million. It has 1,354 students and is fully furnished. And although we've not gotten into the details of that, we're just looking at ways to use our tax dollars wisely and still meet the needs that are being addressed. The Brambleton School is about 44% larger than the proposed school here in Frederick County. And we are trying as best we can to try to meet the needs of collaborative learning, which is what Frederick County wants, in which Loudoun County has been the forefront for that collaborative learning and trying to provide something for Frederick County that is beneficial to everyone the students, the teachers, the taxpayers. So just recognize that we are trying to do that. And if anyone wants to come and talk to any of us on details or information, they're welcome to do so. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Mr. Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead, Mr. Lofton. Okay. Go for it. Okay. Roger Lofton then. I just wanted to uh, remind everyone, and I'm sure they are cognizant of it, that uh, this Monday is Memorial Day. And it's a time when um, we remember the people who died while serving in this country or out of this country to keep us free. And I hope that as the citizens of Frederick County go about their life and celebrating that day and, and having a good time with their families and friends, that they will take a moment out to pause and remember those who have died to give us the freedoms that we so richly enjoy today. Supervisor Trout. Of course, I have to follow that, <laughs> but I concur, Mr. Lofton. You offered. <laughs> I, well, I didn't know, yeah, <sighs> that's the last time. Okay, so uh, I just wanted to make a comment that although I voted for the resolution passed tonight by this board regarding a replacement ailer, um, I don't think that it was appropriate because rather than an appropriation of funds, um, I felt that it was a attempt for us to dictate school design um, by asking the school board to adhere to specific stipulations before we release the funds. Uh, frankly, determining capacity or square footage is not our job, but is the job of the school board. They are elected independently and accountable to their own constituents. Uh, they did request $52 million in January of this year, and this is now um, May that we have brought a formal resolution to our meeting. Um, so I'll, although I am appreciative of this board for this progress, I think it is slow, and I would encourage the school board to respond to, the, to our resolution as soon as possible. Hopefully we can reach a further compromise, um, ideally at our next meeting, so that we can appropriate funds. I'm afraid that if we continue to delay, and you'll have to forgive me because I'm not up on the exact timeline, that we might miss the fall bond cycle or the school board would miss that. So that would further push back the timeline for our new middle school, which I think would upset many of our constituents. So I just wanted to uh, thank the board for uh, passing this resolution, but also state my concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments, anyone? Chairman. Supervisor McCarthy. Um, I appreciate all the folks who come out for all of our public hearings because I think it's educational for all of us to get different perspectives. Um, one of the things that was insinuated tonight was that this board um, isn't looking to the experts 
in planning. Um, I would just like to point out that um, there's also an insinuation made that a 140,000 square foot school wouldn't be sufficient for 900 students. I would just point out that the experts who brought us the request for 52 million also brought us the numbers that a 140 square, 40,000 square foot school could hold 900 students. So we are relying on our school board um, when we make our decisions with regard to capacity. I'd also point out that uh, Supervisor Dunn keeps uh, mentioning the Brambleton Middle School, which is a spectacular school, and I would encourage anyone on this board to go take a look at it and see how it's being um, run. That school is built for 14,000, I'm sorry, 1,400 students' capacity um, with an average square foot per student of approximately 121 square feet, give or take. Um, the proposal um, that we are willing to consider for 140,000 square feet for 900 students equates to um, something more in the range of 100, I'm sorry, what was my number here? It was 155, it's about 155 square feet per student. It's, it's substantially more than other schools are within uh, neighboring counties that are working just fine. So I just wanted to point out that I don't understand where the um, misconception is that we're restricting the schools to the point where we won't be able to facilitate the 900 folks. But I, I just want everyone on the record to know that we are considering that and it's a lot of that information has come directly from the school board using their numbers. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Anyone? Vice Chairman Lofton. Mr. Chairman, I move we adjourn. To adjourn, is there a second? Second, Mr. Chairman. All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, no. We'll stand adjourned. We thank everyone for their time and their attention and their comments.